The next heading would be astrology and the luminaries, which I'm sure you'll explain for anybody that doesn't know what a luminary is in APMIs, mm-hmm. what it equates to in the mainstream. Um, planets, basically, is what I meant. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the questions are uh, would be what what are the heavens? What's your description of the heavens? The heavens. It's the I would call it the upper ether where other things are taking place. You know, there's different layers of angels in, and some are using high altitude and so some at medium and some at low altitudes. So I would say it's um, that's where the high voltage is. That's you know the higher you go, the voltage increases. And that's because we're getting closer to the halos of Adam. Adam's the electric, remember. So the closer we get to electro, the more poten- electrical potential there is in the ether. Um, now, how that works is what the angels are doing in the ether. I'm probably sidetracking here from the question. But what they do in the ether is... The angels in the upper atmosphere are basically channeling down to the ones in the lower atmosphere high energy potential electric through like the vortexes of tornadoes and such. This is your sprites and your tornadoes working together. These are angels working together at different altitudes. They send in the high potential voltage down and the low potential replaces it as it goes up and then that gets reprogrammed as high potential voltage again. So it's an ongoing um, cyclic process of what they're doing in the heavens. Now, and we, you know, we don't know how high they actually go. There's, there's another thing. We've no idea on what height these stop operating at. We don't know, the, you know, their the, their ceiling of operation. We don't know the true ceiling yet. And man can probably not get anywhere near it because of electrical discharges and heat and other things going on. So man's, yeah, you know, so man's limited on mm-hmm. how far up they can send things. Yeah, one's video was fantastic, revealing the um, atmospheres going up. And there are some questions related to... To that. Do you have any questions on, you know, the star signs and things like that coming up? Because oh, I could add them now if you like. Go for it. Go yeah, for it. Just yeah. allow it. Yeah, let it flow. Yeah, you know, the the birth signs. Um, what I realised when I was doing the seasons work, the work to, for the sun to create the calendar across the grid that we're using, I realised that the star signs are actually the gates. This is where the this is what they're tied to, the gates. They're not tied to something in the sky. They're tied to, a, tied to a physical location in the east where the luminaries come from. And if you look at our seasons video, you'll see there's 12 gates show on it. And the, the sequence and the angles of them are what create what we call our seasons. And what it does, it gives the north a season and the south a season. Well, actually, the season's in the north, and then it switches to the south and gives them their summer as we're getting winter. So you've got two equal but opposite things going on with the seasons, north and south of the equator. Mm-hmm. That is by design. That's, you know, the, the globe has to explain this by saying there's a wobble. It wobbles a bit, and it makes the sun go back the other way, and then it wobbles, and it goes back the way again. Well, that's not really what's happening, is it? No, there's a lot more going on with this sun. As you, see. if you watch our seasons video, you'll see how we map it crossing the world, and it crosses the the, the map epicycling, and then you'll see we've added the return path for it to come back because it has to get back to east to start again in, for the next sunrise. Mm-hmm. So, for ten months of the year, it's crossing during the day, illuminated, and returning in a standby state, switched off. Uh, ready to get back to their start position for the next sunrise. That's the light we're seeing in the sky. It returning is part of this technology uh, making its way back. Now Jimbo's decode of this, I showed Jimbo this, and he knew he knew the technological terminology for it. And he said, this is a sweep back transformer and fly back killer. I says, explain that a bit more. I'd heard it before, but I didn't look into it. You know, it didn't mean much to me. So he explained it to me. It's, uh, it sweeps the sun across, 
gets to a certain point, then it suppresses the light and then it flies back as fast as possible to get back to the start position again, which made sense to me. Now I know what I'm looking at because it goes slow across east to west and it returns very, very fast west to east as that light they're trying to call the ISS. So that's the Sweetback Transformer and Flyback Killer. And like I said, that does that for 10 months a year because June and December of the solstices. What happens then, we've got 24 hour sun in the north and the south, one in June and one in December. The December one hasn't been proven, but there is some globe is coming up with something currently, but they're going to fake it because they're going to be looking at the sun on the 14th. Well, that's not the solstice. It has to be after the 22nd of December to catch it doing the 24 hour sun. Now, I've, I've always said it does that in the south, in the Antarctic. We just can't see it because Antarctica's coastline is, I think it's 300 foot tall or something. So you'd never see it in the distance beyond that. Whereas in the north, you can see the glow in the north going across the horizon. Yeah. From, you know, a certain latitude, you can see that. So it has to happen in the south. You know, when people look at the configuration of our map and grid, they'll see it's exact, exactly the same in the south as it would be in the north, only it just mirrors it. It's kind of a mirror, mirroring what's going on in the north. Why wouldn't it? It's symmetrically perfect for doing it. Yeah, and it's a complete balance. And, Mirrored you know, Yeah, and of course, you know, these are the solstice markers which our ancestors had calendars for. It's, what it's telling them is the sun's reached its north, say, say it was the northern 24-hour sun, which is currently ongoing now. Um, once it's reached this position, it's telling you by doing this 24 hour sun, the sun's reached its farthest north point that it's going to go. It's going to do 24 hour sun for a month and then it's going to return back south again down the gates each month. That's what it's doing. Same applies in December. It does the same, it's to let the south know, you know, 24 hour sun cycles there. Uh, obviously, there's another reason it's doing this. It's not just to let us know where the sun is, we know where it is. And we know, we know the solstice is the 24 hour sun. So there has to be a reason why the sun's doing this two times a year. We'll have to look into that deeper yeah. at some point. You know, what is, why is this mechanism going north and south to do this? There's, you know, there has to be another reason for it to me. There's probably something else going on we're not looking at yet. Yeah, why is it rested there? Um, is it collecting energy? Is it giving energy? Is there something, you know, gathering going on or, or a reset type clock? Hmm. You know, mechanism. I mean, it's vast, isn't it, to even think about? I know your your brain is probably thinking, well, yeah, I've got much better ideas than that. But you know, everyone mm. else's brain is like, yes, let's think about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to. You got to. You know, you've got to go down these avenues. We know it exists. We know what it's doing. What's the reason it's doing it? <laughs> you know, why why is it doing that? You have to ask yourself. Yeah, we know it's doing it, but why is it doing it, sir? Those questions have to be answered as well. Is there a specific reason it does that in the north and south? Other than, it, you know, it can't just be to let us know it's 24 hours soon and it's going to start going back the other way because I'm pretty sure humans would figure that out after a few seasons. Yes. So there's another reason there why they do this and I haven't figured it out yet. You know, I haven't given it a lot of, lot of deep thought but one day I'll so then maybe work a bit more of that out. Why does it Ooh, go north and south? You know, that's the beauty of this research, isn't it? It never ends. <laughs> this is never going to end. And you can never, you never find anything, everything and prove everything. It's an impossible task for anyone. Yeah, unless the creator of whoever or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, you're trying, you, you, can't, you, you can't preempt the creator. You can't, you know, you can't try and guess what the creator's plan is because you, you don't know it. You won't see it. The cycles here that probably haven't even started yet. It's been and everything is codependent. That's what's coming around. You know that you see constant spirals of things, but it's the synchronicities. It's everything has its place, its time, its purpose in this construct. It does. And so you know, and and obviously APM have done vast um, research in, into the construct and what's going on behind the scenes um, with you know, the parasite people, yeah. but it, it, that bigger picture, I mean, you know, my understanding is that you really do see, you know, like into the TARDIS, but the rest of us don't. So, you know, it, there has to be people that come to the table to extend this knowledge yeah. for, for you. 
Yeah, you know you that's know. that's another thing. That, you know, I'm uh, hoping people from the science community start getting in touch. Uh, Seeker, yeah. Seeker from our Discord's already sent an email to Judy Woods. So fingers crossed that she gets back in touch and we can have a little chat. And as, as you've yes. seen with some of the okay. memes I've made, you know, I made a meme for the tribes to my west. Mm -hmm. uh, they should recognise the sacred geometry in there and my decodings of what it really is connected to. And that's their birthright and there's an invite for them. I want to have counsel with the tribes because I've got information they need to complete their creation stories. Yes, you do. Going off quilter a little bit there, um, talking about the ancestral knowledge and things, the Druids, for instance, which they're called in Ireland, it would be Dre, but they're the people that were, um, everyone associates, that held a knowledge, you know, a, a whatever, a priest-like thing. Um, you can equate it to, or a teacher, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also linked with the British monarchy, Okay, so, you know, they have their ceremonies and the Freemasonry thing. It's very Druid-like, a lot of this ritual stuff that they've incorporated. And I'm not saying our ancestors were necessarily doing it. But do you think they've possibly, you know, you know, like I've said about sort of tribal elders and things, um, maybe knowing some things but not all, or hiding some knowledge because of their own safety for their own you know future tribe and things like that and you know do you think this our ancestors for instance the the celts the irish whatever um were hijacked swept in and uh, uh, sort of working against you know our own ancestors these days <laughs> well what we, what we do <laughs> what we do know is you know when the romans invaded they invaded somewhere south of, in, in south england and they thought that was it, that would be Britain conquered. But then they realised Britain wasn't actually being run from England, it was being run from Anglesey in Wales, which was the Druids, it was coming from the Druids. They were the, yeah. the mind of Britain, not just Britain. Yeah. You know, this actually spread way in, far into Europe, the, the reach of the yeah. Druids and the teachings. It was, a lot of it was coming from Wales. And it doesn't look like they've done to Wales what they've done to other places, but... You know, when you look at, um, like, coinage, you will not see the Welsh dragon on coins. You know, when you look at certain coins, you'll see you'll see the harp from Ireland, you'll see the rampart lion from Scotland, you'll see England's lions, but you won't see anything yes. from Wales. You just see two sets of England lions. That's so, yeah, you know, when they, so they've, you know, they've stolen everything from Wales and assumed the position of of being the teacher but now they only teach it to those they want to teach it to it seems yes you know they've copyrighted haven't they they've stolen it and copyrighted it hijacked it yeah that's what i'm seeing anyway and i'm pretty sure people in wales are noticing you know where's the welsh flag and the union jack there's definitely something with Wales. Um, we've had that yeah, conversation. Yeah, you know, and there is a Prince of Wales. You know, the Prince of Wales is not a person. The Prince of Wales is an oh. angel in the underworld. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the real Prince of Wales <laughs> is an angel below Cardiff. There you go. Mm, a very no. it's, that, yeah. that yeah. one plays a very important role. That's why it's called a prince in modern times. In you know, in ancient times, it'll have been some other name, other title. You know, names and titles change, but the technology just keeps doing what it's designed to do. Like clockwork, isn't it? It just ticks over doing what it does. Yeah. Did that so, answer the did that answer the question? Because I can't remember what the question was now. <laughs> Um, we, we sort of started with the heavens and then I went off onto a tangent, didn't I, about druids, mm, so... Right, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're on about the <laughs> luminaries, yeah. <laughs> so luminaries, <laughs> a, a quick jump back to luminaries, you know, the stars are, are nodes on halos. That was my question, yeah. Yeah, because, um, um, you know... What are you, stars and what are they made of? <laughs> the, the, uh, not, well, they're actually technology. <laughs> what you see in the sky is an effect from technology below. 
it's not physically in the sky, the technology, but its effects and visual representations are in the sky. So what we're seeing in the sky are effects from technology in the underworld. If you look on our map and grid, you'll see six concentric circles. These circles have nodes on them, and they're what create the stars. We see they're actually seeing various nodes on halos. That's what stars are. So you see, it's seen. Well, the the entity in the sky is this. It's the spirit of the real thing in the underworld. You know, electromagnetism has elevated them there, and it's rotating them. It's given that that rotational appearance. East yes. to, and east to west to rotation. It's actually west to east, but going so fast, we perceive it to be east to west. Is what I wagon think. wheel effect. Yeah, you know, I've decoded that before, and that's what we're really seeing. So we're seeing the effects of this technology, and its pivot points are the north and south poles. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, imagine if, if people haven't seen our 144,000 video where I've done an animation of this. Um, you could, you know, Im imagine a hamster ball that you're running inside of and the two sides of it are on a pivot. That would be an north and south pole, so it's making the ball revolve east to west, isn't it? That's kind of what the stars are doing. You know, remove the ball but keep the stars. It's still doing the same motion. It's revolving. And one one easy way to explain that to people, you know, they talk about star rotation being different in the south to the north. They're not. They're all revolving in the same direction. This is what the globe needs to survive. It needs to put an opposite rotation in the south. Well, there isn't one. Because the easiest way to explain it to someone, simply face west. Now look right to, to your north. And now get your arm and follow uh, Polaris's rotation, which is counterclockwise. So your arm should be rotating counterclockwise. You can copy this as well, Junipers, you do it as well. <laughs> so you've got your right, so you got right arm rotating counterclockwise. So it's like a half of a swimming motion, isn't it? You're swimming with one arm. Your arm should be doing that, revolving that direction, which, you know, back to front, you've got west and front, you're east behind you, so it's revolving east to west. Now look south to your left, and now copy the Southern Star Trail rotations. Well, they revolve clockwise. So, okay. Both arms should now still be moving in a swimming motion, like the butterfly stroke or the front crawl, east to west. Show me the opposite rotation in, the, in that. There isn't any. They're both revolving the same way. Same way. Aren't they? I think, yeah. yeah. You can't do it any other way. That's what the stars in the north and south are doing, and the ones above you are doing exactly the same. They're going east to west, visually. So that's an easy way to show you there is no counter rotation of stars in the south. And all you were doing was mimicking what the star trails in the north and south would actually do. Do they um, return the same way in the same way as as the luminaries, sort of, because they're on a halo? Do they do they return? Good question, no. because, you know, what happens in the underworld? Do they switch off in the underworld as they go through the underworld? Because that revolution has to be a full circle to come back up again for the next night. That's a good question, and something we can't answer. We don't know if they shut down, or does it just keep doing it, and somewhere down in the underworld, they, they're going through the underworld as well. Yeah. We don't actually, you know, we can't answer it. that, but it's a good question, you know, do they shut down as well as the other luminaries do, and it just carries on again? I don't know. Without exploration, I think I'd be struggling to answer that one. <laughs> I can't prove that they shut down at night or not. How many luminaries assist in maintaining and sustaining the creation process? Would you say how many? How many have you identified, and do you think there's more? Or? Luminaries. Yes. Um, we know we have the sun and the moon. That well, there's other, there's other things we have to factor in now because of this technology, we've been technology that elevates, there's going to be things above this technology in the sky, above its effects in the sky, that's also stuck there as well. Yeah. Because these this technology is not just moving around, it's creating matter as it's moving. You know, you're shooting stars and things, that's matter being produced by this technology and it's just literally falling out of the sky. That's what you're seeing, you're shooting stars and beaches and things like that this is 
matter being produced by this technology in the atmosphere and it's just dropping out the sky and we're calling them shooting stars it's you know this it's part of the creation process i forgot, the, just, I forgot where the question we, was we, now <laughs> but yeah that's what the you know how the, many luminaries assist in maintaining and sustaining the creation the stars are all rotating as one unit when you look at it. You know, you do that uh, with your arms, what I showed you. They're, they're all operating as one unit, the stars. All of them are operating as one unit. Yeah. So yeah, super, they, something yeah. is controlling all of them at the same time. I always imagine it like, you know, like we used to play skip skip rope sort of thing. One, one person would hold that end of the rope and somebody would hold the other end. And then you just rotate, and then you know. I always yeah. imagine. Yeah, well, that's like that's that. perfect. Yeah, you're skipping rope. That's perfect the way of doing it. You know, you to you're skipping. That's exactly what the stars are doing. That's perfect. I don't know why I didn't use the skipping rope. That's even easier than using the arms. Let's <laughs> get a skipping there rope. Go, that's skipping. That's what your stars are doing. And yeah. the, and you'll notice that the hands have to work in unison. So there's no counter rotation of arm there, is there, to emulate what the stars are doing? Mm. Excellent. And Good, the stars uh, yeah. are on that rope. And if there's multiple ropes, you know, sort of thing, that, that, that's how I... Yeah, well, the, the six that I've all overlaid on the grid, you know, there might be even more than that. We don't know what's beyond what we've got anyway. There might be more outside of that, and that's why there appears to be even more up there than what you would imagine just coming from six. But until someone tells me how many star trails are in between Polaris and Polaris Australis in the south, if you can count the star trails from there to there... That'll give you a number. Now double it, and that'll tell you how many nodes we've got on that halo. I know it's going to be a lot, <laughs> but yeah. How long do you think it would take? <laughs> <laughs> well, no one's ever told me that number, so and I'm, I haven't got the time to sit there counting them. But you know, there's not just uh -huh. there's not just one set is the thing. You know, there's you know I've put, I've added six there that do the same kind of process. They all have to be in the same kind of process. If they're all running at the same time, I'm not sure. There might just be one running at the moment. There might be more to see yet, or, or less. That's the beauty of this, you know. There's still surprises to come. Exactly. It's, yeah, revelation. Yeah. Um, can you give an insight into the roles of each luminary? Um, like, you know, I know the sun and the moon, the so you can start your decodes with and mm. you may have some more info on other luminaries you may not but well they've all got um secondary processes going on yeah you know the sun it gives us daylight and such but it's also producing you know elements and things off the elemental chart and it'll be certain frequency that they're producing them at so they're all working together but they're all doing complete, completely different roles and um processes it seems to me they look the same technology but each one of them is doing something different now you can go back to the the, the main the, the gods of the main uh, creation story because it tells you now you know the seven gods that were always at war with each other but one day they decided to work together because they realized together they can can create and that's a lovely creation story because that's what they're all doing they're all creating and stitching this world together and, you know, we yeah. need to identify what role is each one doing in, you know, in the ether and in the underworld uh, and even in the heavens, I suppose. You know, each they're all doing something very special connected to creation. They're not just ornaments. They're all doing, you know, something important. Elements. Yeah, Maybe. yeah. All the elements and things like that have to come into it. They create the elements. Uh, you know, which ones are creating which and... Uh, what locations all this all this has to come into it and not just them ones they're the moving ones then you've got all the rainbows local everywhere they're all doing the same kind of processes mm -hmm. so there's a lot going on isn't there <laughs> a lot more than meets the eye you wouldn't yeah, no, it's... you know you can look outside and think well all that's going on but i'm not seeing it with my eye as well until you start decoding the rainbows you're not going to see anything you've got this Decode your local rainbows and watch how they create your weather and things. Then you can get a better idea of how this world works. The watchers, huh? Mm, yeah, watch them. <laughs> watch them, study them. That's what we tell people. You go out and study your rainbows. There's more to them than meets the eye. 
you know, we might find even more information uh, using the Rainbow Warrior program because people are coming to it with new ideas and new avenues of exploration might just start appearing and even better, you know, we go further. But we can only go yeah. so far, remember, because, you know, we're going to get to a point where we run out of things to decode, which <laughs> might take a thousand years, that. <laughs> it's going to take a long time. But we can never know all this. That's the beauty of it. I don't want to know all this. I, I know I can't know all this. It's impossible to know all this. There's too much. I'm quite happy with what, what I've learned already, and that is a tremendous amount. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And would you say that our brains can hold all that info? Oh, yeah. <laughs> or is easy. it our heart? Easy. <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> it surprises me how much can be stored in the human mind. It really yeah. does. Massive processes. But when you find this, you, you know, you can now cut out the bullshit. All the bullshit just vanishes. So you, you can get rid of that out of your brain and make some room for the good stuff, can't you? Yeah, Cause, the Because uh, cause currently, yeah. currently, cradle to grave, our, our minds are getting filled with bullshit. So time to shove all that out and get the good stuff in, isn't it? Absolutely. We need to, you know, reabsorb what our ancestors knew, find out what they teach. Everything like that has to come back because that was when everything was sacred and pure. Connections, finding those connections again, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. We've, got, and we've got to unite to do it, people. Put your differences aside and come and work with us. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll get. We'll guide you till you know. What we'll do is, like we do with any, anyone that joins us, we'll guide them to where they can start doing this themselves, and they can teach their friends, and the, and the whole world will know, know about it in quick time. It's standing in your own power, um, learning. You know the fact that. Or relearning the fact that you're at your own powerhouse and that you know you shouldn't be looking elsewhere um, to find the, the knowledge of this earth. You know, I don't mean with APM, I mean, you know, looking at um, sycophantic worship, even to government or whatever. But yeah, we, we everybody needs to stand on their own two feet and own this, don't they? Yes, they need to yes, stop yes. They need, they need to take ownership of this. It's your birthright, people. Yeah. We're fighting for you and the Creator. That's what we're doing. This is what we're about. This, for us, this is decoding this live research, decoding investigation into how this world works and who created it. That's the most important thing to know and look into, in my opinion. Not Tartari and, and things like this. No, this is the most important thing. Who created this and how it works? And why has it been hidden from us? Not just hidden. Why has it been stolen from us? This is our birthright. Yeah. People want free energy. We've already got it. You stop paying your bills. Because this, yes. uh, this electric is free. It's already here. Mm -hmm. And man doesn't own it. Who, who, who dares take ownership of this? Mm -hmm. That's where you've got them. You cannot take ownership of this. Water in the air now. Yeah. You can't, you can't reverse engineer this and just take ownership of it. Sorry, this is not yours. This is the creator's. And that's something very precious and sacred to everyone, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I want to know how the sun produces heat and does it permeate from below in a rising fashion? But I know you were saying about the, 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 the heat. Um, yeah. The... the um, they emit cold and heat. Uh, plus, you know, the, it's it's induction and conduction. You've got induction taking place and conduction. Uh, it's the induction that creates the heat, just like your induction stove on a cooker. Okay. That's so you tell me. Eve, Eve is the inductor and Adam's the conductor. Okay. So between them, they do that magical mix of electromagnetism. That's where, the, that's where the heat comes from. Like I said earlier, you know, Adam creates the heat. The electric is what's creating the heat. And what do they do when they're together? <laughs> uh, create lightning. <laughs> they create lightning. So they, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, well, they create the sun, actually. You know, if you want to see how bright a spark they can create, just look at the sun, because that is produced from the fusion reaction of Adam and Eve's positive and neg negative electric. That is... 
electricity arcing out onto a steel ball down below that's well some type some type of metal ball i'm assuming steel but whatever it is it's going to be glowing white hot and it's its spirit has been elevated into the sky so there is heat above and below okay because eve, eve below you know that's conduction the sun is an adam and eve technology they all are you know they're well as far as we know they are <laughs> but yeah it's a male female relationship going on yes yin and yang yeah, that's them does the sun energize the moon during an eclipse of the sun mm, that's a good question yeah. does the sun energize the moon during an eclipse well the moon's currently in a return back east there uh, when, when we're not seeing it uh, saying that it can go west as well as east um, depending on its cycle of course but um, does it energize it that's a good question the, the, the moon from what I can make out um, energy any energy the sun isn't using the moon gets because like at night time I think it was mentioned it in the book of Enoch you know uh, the sun gives part of its light to the moon so that's telling me the moon get some energy for when the sun's not using it you know it's not actually physically transferred into it it's getting it can use the energy from the ether that the sun would yeah. normally be using so you look at the sun look at the moon during the day you don't see it illuminated like you do at night so it is self-illuminating at night they all, they all self-illuminate um yeah but is, does it charge it i don't know because, um, you know, we don't know the process of what the moon's actually doing yet. People say it's just the tidal, blah, blah, blah. But they're all, they, they can all shift the tides and waters, plus the halos that are stationary are doing that. Yeah, good question, and not something I can answer immediately. Mm, but from Walter, okay. from Walter Russell's work, the sun is a generator, and the rest of them are regenerators, like backing the sun up. So the sun is king, you know, there's obviously a pecking order, that's why it's called a king. <laughs> the sun is king and the rest fall in order below that. But all that also applies to the layers that they're operating in. These are your seven golden candlesticks. Seven planets. Yes, there's not nine, one. there's not nine, there's seven. And the anti kiffin mechanism, you'll see all seven on there. So our ancestors had this well worked out thousands of years ago. Mm. And enough to map it onto a hand crank computer called the Antikythera mechanism. It's an amazing, it yeah, it's an amazing piece of technology. Way out of time, you know. It's it's out of place and time from two thousand years ago, and it's hand crank mechanical computer that can plot the movement of all these luminaries, past, present, and future cycles. I'm sure many of us, you know, you know, civilizations, whatever you want to call them in our communities around the earth must have had these calendars of sorts oh yes yeah yeah we had calendars probably for every luminary that exists yeah and, ones and, we, and you know don't forget there's ones we probably haven't even seen yet like you know like Haley's comet pops up every 76 years that's just something yeah. on a halo going past that the rotation's that slow we're not going to see it for another 76 years when the rotation comes back again and also, you know, all these landmarks, you know, like the um, Celtic and, and, you know, Cairns and, and things could be markers for angels, I get that. But there's also these, you know, places where that you're observing the luminaries as such, like, you know, the solstice or, or whatever, especially in Ireland, there's those. Um, and there were many more, I'm sure, that were acting as calendars. The land had, you know... Oh yeah, yeah. They were not, just not just calendars, not just calendars, because that's where they'll be teaching you as well. The, you know, all the younger generations have to learn all this. They'll be taking them to these places at certain times of year to teach them and show them. Yes. So they were schooling. Yes. You know, they were being schooled on this to a really good standard as well. By the look of it. Oh, highly intelligent. Capable. Oh yeah, yeah. We but, can only, we can know, only they... at the moment we can only dream on what they knew two thousand years ago. Yeah, unfortunately, we've had generational poisoning, and not just you know of what's been told to us, but our bodies and and spirits are being poisoned daily. Um, 
so yeah we're certainly um not working how we should do and mm. our ancestors were um is my take on it yeah yeah they're, they're different we're living in those days to what we've got now what we've got now is an entity trying to suppress us and put its boot on our necks and keep us down and dumb and they just want rid of us to be honest that's what they like uh, well, that's what we're at today these people just want rid of us now yeah. they want this to themselves they've got what they want they use this all to get what they want now they've got it they want rid of us and that's what I'm seeing. They're trying to get rid of as many as possible before this reset because they don't want you to see this reset, which is becoming evident more and more. Well, they're hiding the skies a lot now, aren't they, at the moment? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, this, you know, these halos that you see, there's a halo above every rainbow, stationary halo. These are what people are calling the lunar waves, the halos. They're off the technology below the, uh, that's below the rainbows. That's the atom in the sky that they're seeing. That's what's being recorded when the moon passes. So we're going to see all them one day. These are the hoppy prophecy spider webs in the sky. When they all overlap, they're going to look like spider webs. That's that's because you're just actually seeing them. This is revelations. Yes. This is what revelations is. Hell will be revealed in the end times. <laughs> it's the end of a cycle, and we're starting to see it. And this cycle is taking us into a mini ice age that these people are trying to call global warming. No, they're, they're trying to artificially warm it so it hides most of this. Because ice crystals and water droplets help us see electromagnetics, I've discovered. And that's where all these halo pictures were so successful over the last few years. I've yet to see one, um, <laughs> but many have. They're on the videos. Yeah, um, you'll see one. <laughs> <laughs> they just peek. They just oh. peek a boo you and then you won't see them for a while. <laughs> I know the the moon halo. I've seen the moon halo. I know, I know I know where I can capture that, but the sun yet to reveal itself. Well, it took and me a while to it did take me a while to get the moon halo on and it's a very big halo. Mm. Very, very big, uh, but only because it's in a you know it's operating in a layer lower than the sun, so it looks it's closer to us than the sun. In the la in the layers that and it's, it's operating in. We had that discussion before. I'll just touch on that while, while we're talking about it. But the layers above, um, and the sun at the top layer, and then you know the moon, the nearest, you know, to the earth mm -hmm. layer. And would that then reflect in the underworld? So would the, you know, the sun be the bottom, bottom layer, you know, and the moon nearer the earth, you know? Again, like the mirror. Well, yeah, yeah, you have to wonder, you know, what's below. As it layered below, it probably has to be layered to fit it all in. Mm. Different layers below and above. That makes sense, doesn't it? They've it all got their own indeed. layers below and above because... The diameter of the halo dictates the altitude the cone or the spiral from the angel is going to go into the sky. Mm -hmm. So if you want it high up, it's going to have to be a very wide diameter halo. They're the really big ones. They're the big rainbows that we come across. They're being elevated way high into the sky. The Glastonbury one? Yeah, that's another important one that's um, part of the... Um, the Milky Way decode, it's a world chakra. So it's an important one below there that's related to the chakras of the world. Which is the, the heart chakra. Yeah, so it's the spiral of, you know, the uh, the spiral in pressure waves that's going across the map. It's, um, I'm pretty sure it activates and deactivates things there. And they use this waveguides. We're going to get deeper into the waveguides with uh, Chris someday. So I'll keep that, I'll, keep, I'll leave that till the next day, that, explaining that one a bit more. That's no worries, that's great. And going back to the moon, are the phases of the moon eclipses, types of eclipses, or are they something else? Mm, yeah, another good question, because what, why is it doing it? <laughs> why, is, why does the moon have phases? Yep. It's a good, very good question, and some I haven't worked out yet why it has to do it. Um... I could speculate, but I won't do that because I haven't really done a lot with the moon. I wanted to get the sun out the way first because that was the important one for the grid because it gives us the seasons, you know. And I said in the seasons video, 
To do the moon and know how many gates it's actually using, we need to be at the equator facing east as close to the date lines as possible, or anywhere to, on the equator really, but preferably be in the east, so we can see where it comes from and we can work out its sunrise angles and sets from there. Then we'll have an idea what the, the moon cycle is doing. Because we haven't. So boots you know, on ground. Boots on the ground required for in the east for the yeah the moon cycles. Where's you know the, the moonrise angles? We could probably get them off time and date if you could pick somewhere near the equator. It does show you the moonrise angles for that location, mm. which is you know this is how we worked out with the sun one. Um, the sun one's a bit harder because it's using twelve gates that I had to work out the sequence and cycle that would make sense. That creates this analema orbit that we see the uh, not the orbit the analema of the sun. And also these gates yeah. functioning and working and changing the times, daylight hours and times. And it does work. It works perfect. Yes. Everything's got its timing. And we have to, so do, to, we have to do that with the moon and then all the others as well. You know, we have to do what the, the ancients did. They had calendars for it all and we need to do the same. Because yeah, the, the calendar, right. yeah, their calendars work, but it's not giving us the full picture, is it? No, that leads on to the other question of what type of expertise, expertise sorry, or knowledge uh, within astronomy would be advantageous to furthering the decode of the luminaries. So if you need boots on ground, you need people observing from points in the, on the Earth. Boots on the ground and wings in the sky. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, um, I don't know how, how uh, much any of our team members are into astrology. And how much they actually know, and do they know, you know, there's a lot to learn just in the sky. Too much, too many for me. I just know how it works. Uh, anyone that's wanting to do anything else, well, that's by all means go ahead. So you know, if anyone in the group or beyond wants to take on do more with the stars in this group, by all means, help yourself. Join in and let us show us what you've got, and you know, you can tell tales on it or whatever, whatever comes into it. It does need discussed. All of these topics need discussed in in depth and so we understood uh, understand better how it all works and you know slots in with one another we're just scratching yeah. the surfaces of all these topics to show people they exist it's up to them and team members and anyone else that wants to join us is to go deeper down these topics to see what else is in there because there will be other things we haven't discussed yet you know i'm wondering you know how abstract we all are um maybe you know, the tangible things like that is, you know, that's going to give the most satisfaction, you know, to people, you know, because you can do the tailspin, head spin, you know, sort of, you know, who are we, where are we, but, you know, who am I? And everybody needs to know that, I get that, but those tangible things, so, you know, of going and doing the work, going looking, observing, witnessing, being part of, yeah, it's very, it's very satisfying. It is. It's it's mm. nice to be involved in. Well, yeah, I, I agree, and I've only, you know, come in and 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 um. Found the staff <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. It happens. You know, it happens. Things like this are going to happen. You know, people are going to find all kinds of things and have their own revelations. People are going to have revelations we have not yet. Because they'll know something mm. different and something else will click for them that we don't even know anything about or we haven't seen yet. Exactly. So, so we look forward to your revelations, everyone else's revelations, you know, what revelations are you having that we haven't had yet. Or it's, it's actually cool to watch people discussing these in our Discord. It's exciting yeah. to watch because, you know, you, I've been there, I know what it feels like and that feeling never leaves you when you discover something. And people's going to discover a lot more than we have. We're just scratching surfaces and showing you, hey, look down here, there's a rabbit hole here. Someone get in there quick. <laughs> <laughs> but only to a certain point, you know, we've got to respect this. It's it's all fun and games and stuff and learning and that, but how far do we go is the question. How far should we go is the question, isn't it? And these people have overstepped the mark already. Yeah, because creation has been turn to destruction and um, you know it, it's just perverse scenarios perverse scenarios of creation and um, 
we have to say no more. Yeah, enough's enough. Yeah. Isn't it? It is. Now, going on to the angel technology, how do um, how do you see that the religious texts describe angels in you know in any context? I know you were talking about the um, translator and everything, but um, how how does the Bible, for instance, how does it describe angels to the masses? What are they? Yeah, you know, when you look at the descriptions of like uh, Noah. Uh, you know, described as having eyes that light up and things that, you know, straight away you think, well, that's not a person, is it? You know, it's, it's, it, anyone that reads the Bible, I've noticed, they know this stuff there, but they can never figure out what the hell it's talking about. You get lost in it. I've seen people do it online, they're reading things and say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Others will pretend it does and, and you know, that's up to them. You have to decode it and make sense of it. And what it's the only way you're going to make sense of the holy books is realize this is technology he's trying to describe. And they probably didn't have the word, the right words for it, what we've got access to today, because they didn't exist in those days. Perhaps the words they describe what they were looking at. Um, what was the question? Sorry, I keep sidetracking now. That's fine. That's normally mean it does that um how do the religious texts describe angels so you know, where does this winged thing come from you know you know, you know, uh, you know this winged man or woman <laughs> I, f I forget half what it said in the books to be honest now it was that long ago i looked at them you know i haven't read the whole bible i've just looked for certain bits and pieces that assured me yeah you're on the right path there's technology in this book so i didn't need to look any further other than looking at for certain parts so I can't tell you what's in the Bible, you know, that all of, I haven't read it all. I'm just looking for the technology hiding in the Bible, and once I find it, I move to something else, because I know it's there. Um, and, you know, knowing with APMIs, they're creator gods as such, cre cre creators. Yeah, yeah, you know, you can do. compare them to what your ancestors would tell you about the gods of the underworld, because it's the same gods they're talking about. Violent... Um, Recyclable, um, always fighting, <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing, you know, casting yeah. this one out. <laughs> yeah, chaotic. Yeah. It doesn't matter, yeah. you know, you can you can take your own your own uh, ancestors' information and look at it and compare it and, and know, yeah, they're talking about the same thing, just different names for it. And then you can look at someone else's and realise, well, theirs is the same, but it's different. It's just different names and different locations. So that angel's unique to that location. So you're going to get local angel myths and legends. And then you're going to get the national or international in myths and legend ones, which are like the sun and moon travelling by. Mm. You've got to find the technology that's hiding in the texts. Not just the texts, the glyphs, myths, legends, everywhere. There's technology hiding there. Yeah. So it's not you know it's not unique to just holy books. It's literally everywhere in it's, it's on coinage. You name it, it's jewelry coinage. All kinds of things cover it. It is indeed. How do you imagine that the angels came into existence? They had to be created by hand, which tells you oh. this in your Bible. You know, it's to, this world was built by hand. Well, come on, people, think about it. How would you build this world by hand? What is it actually constructing to create this world? What creates this world is the question. The angels do. So what are the angels? They're the technology that creates what we're calling nature. And how did they come into existence, the yeah, they, angel? I mean, They had to that. be built by hand. And where do those materials come from? Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Who had access to the metals before the angels created these metals? Where did exactly. these where did this oh, technology yeah. yeah, it's like a chicken and the egg thing again, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've thought of that before. Yeah, you know, what, what well, yeah, it's built by hand, so but where did you get the technology to build it by hand? But don't forget it might be a lot more simple than people realise the, the first mechanisms of this. Because if you look at the pyramid, 
You won't see much metal work in the pyramid, but that is conductive. Yes. There's conductive stone. Yes. Isn't there? But where did that come from? Was it conductive before the angels were built or after the angels were built? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was the, you know, what are the, what are the angels resting on? Because everything above them has been created over the top of them since them days. That's why they became sealed, the seal of the 144,000 in the now underworld. It probably wasn't the underworld at some point in time. It became yeah, the underworld, you know, over time because it's producing matter that's creating land mass and everything else. Yes. Yes. What What is the foundation? I mean, the mind boggles. Yeah. How deep does it go? I don't, know. <laughs> I don't think anyone can answer that. You know, the, the, the mainstream will tell you eight miles, but no, that's the depth they wanted to get to. They stopped there because that's roughly where some of the quakes are coming from, which is this technology switching on. So at the Cola Borehole, they dr drilled down to an angel room, pretty much. Mm. And they told the world that's as far as you can go, and no one's looking at it anymore. Well, I bet they are. I bet they're probing into that room now and seeing what's in there and reverse engineering it, painting it into their badge work and saying, we built this, look. Yeah. So easy to do, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's it's hidden in plain sight as well. That's the most sort of, you know, in-your-face thing, isn't it? When you realise. But is all life made by the angel technology? All organic life? Yes. Yes, it has to be. Okay. Do you want me to go deeper on that? <laughs> go deeper if you need to. There. This is this going is to be a, this is going to be a shocker for people, especially people of religious beliefs. Now, okay. in your holy book, it tells you, "Our Father who art in heaven." Now, remember, Mother Earth is Eve. So, whose father? Skies. Adam. Yep. <laughs> so the Adams and Adam had to exist that created us. We are creations of this technology, programmed by the Creator to create what we are calling ourselves as human beings. We are a product of this technology, literally a product of it. Again, go back to Mauro Biglino's interview with Sarah Westall, and in the second part of that interview, you can find it, you will find. There's lots of experimentation and things being mentioned in holy books that, it, that the Vatican are not putting in holy books, but that Moro Bellino translated. And it's telling him there was genetic modifications and all kinds going on. So, you know, the creator is programming and creating using technology. It makes sense because <laughs> this is how strange it is. Everything in this world is being produced by technology, yet, and now we're here producing technology. So it creates man. Man, <laughs> technology creates man, man creates technology. <laughs> we, we, go, we go hand in hand, don't we? We, but we are back, processors and back, creators. Yeah, we're co-creators. But going back to that important thing I said, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, look at that word, hallowed. You know, has it been extended a bit? Was it halo wed be thy name? Because they, they're locked in halo wedding. It's the wedding yes. of these two halos, you're Adam and Eve. It's yes. back to that creation world again, isn't it? The creation process, Adam and Eve. Yes. You're two halos, two, two counter-rotating flows, creating electromagnetism. This even goes down into your marriage vows, your two wedding rings on your fingers. That represents these two halos. The halos, yeah. That's how special your wedding vows are. They represent Adam and Eve's halos. The, this technology's creation, the, these halos, is what rings represent. So that's what I meant when you, it's saving in jewellery. So you, that decodes now your wedding bands. That's the coming together of an Adam and Eve, isn't it? Your wedding. They're now, they're now wedlock, and now they're going to go and co-create. By having children. They are indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's it's like poetry in motion, isn't it? Isn't it? It my 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 I, I just sit here smiling when I listen to you, so yeah. 
you can just go on and on forever. So the creator has used use technology to help create us people. If you're not understanding this, this is what the this is how we've come into creation by using technology and other methods unknown to us, but known to the creator. All these life forms in this world have been brought into this world using technology and the mastermind programming of the creator. And we're no exception. Oh no, 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 we're no exception. Everything's come into this world by that kind of design and it's hard to call it, give it a right word because um, you can literally appear into existence from nowhere. Manifest. And not only that, when you appear or when uh, I covered this in an old video where some they were experimenting and they were getting insects to appear. It's no different Japanese. to that. It's it's an extension of that. It's an extension of that process. And when they appear, they're not just you know just this thing that lives. They actually have got instinct. They know what to do. So they never existed. All of a sudden, they exist and they know what to do. And there's this survival blueprint already intelligible within that yes. manifestation. Now, if you look at Walter Russell's chart for the elements, yeah. Yeah. The elemental chart. Now we need a chart for every species. Similar yes. to Walter Russell's to show you how it was came into existence, don't we? Yes. <laughs> should we have such a thing? Should we even discuss such a thing? Should I have told the world such a thing? I don't know. That's up to you because you're editing this how you see fit. Yes. <laughs> But, you know, that needs to go out there as well. It's going to piss a lot of people off. But I can edit that bit out. But, uh, yeah, I think I'll leave that in because it's going to come to that question at some point in time. How were we created? Yeah, I mean, some people are going to say, oh, but, you know, haven't we just been placed here? You know, and, and I from where? get that. And you where know, did we come? You've, you've got there to you go. go. Who handpicked yeah. us and put us? Yeah. You've got to go back yeah. right to, well, how did we come into existence, haven't you? You've got to go back to that question yeah. now. When did, when did we come into existence and how did we come into existence? Yes. By well, whose hand? Yes. So we've answered that now, haven't we? This answers that question question people hasn't even thought of before I would imagine. I've never thought about it before. Well wow. how did we come into being? Well I think there's plenty of evidence for that now, isn't there? Are all the angels programmed to work as one mechanism? No. No, they do they do different roles. Yeah. You'll notice that with your you local angels, thing. you'll know you'll notice your local angel it just churns along doing what it does every week, and all of a sudden it'll do something crazy with the weather, uh, and it's normally because there's something passing, like the moon or something, you know, something passing nearby, and it's now got involved in supporting role of that luminary, and it'll change what it's doing. It's got a little bit more servitude to to to. Uh, yeah, it has to work a bit harder, perhaps, to you know get the energies up for the technology to use. Because remember, they're, they're sending the positive and neg negatives up and down into the ether, churning the ether up into alternating current, and this technology utilizes it. Yeah, I have, um, I you know, the my my local angel here. I'm sitting right on top of this smaller angel, I think, but. Um, on the on the heavily sprayed days, for instance, which we've spoken about, I am convinced that I see harder work going on. You know, with the winds, etc. Almost like it's trying to clear the chems, but you know. That's yeah, it's just the chems are just in the way, and it will blast them out of the way while yeah. it's doing its process. And, you know, it's got its it's got its uh, programming to do. So you see, you know, it is an automated system. We've had that question before, you know, is the people or life forms down below like running it? Well, no, because that when you bring a life form into it, that's got a lifespan, so you'd have to rule that out. Yes, something has, organic like that. It has, yeah, to be, it, it has to be an automated process that's all connected together and it's got such programming, you know, it's, it's probably mind-boggling to look at. Um, but that's what they're all well, there's doing. There's lots of questions. People are fascinated with angels, so that's where you, you've got 
quite a few of your questions. That's why we call it the that's why we call it the angelic particle matrix. You know, it's a matrix of them. Some are working independently, and some work. So at the times they can all work together. And are they all stationary? No, you know, you've got the your moving ones down below and above. You look at a tornado. Yes. That actually moves across the map. Now, is the halo below that moving across the map, or is the tornado just following the halo along to the next node, or the next node, the next node, and then double back on itself as it goes round the, the halo? We need yes. to study, you know, their, their motion on the ground a bit more to answer that question, and that's not something I've done yet. So there's a job for someone if they want, you know, track these tornado paths oh. and... If you see any doubling back or making curves like round the bend of a halo, then we know what it's doing, don't we? If not, then it's probably the whole unit moving below. So that would answer that question, I think. Yes, it did. Now, do angels have a consciousness or an ability to make decisions? <laughs> Good question. I wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to answer that without exploring down below and looking at the programming. I'm going to ask this question now then. It was an end question, but I'm going to ask it now. Do you think you'll ever see an angel um, I below? So. I hope so. It should, be part of your, it should be part of a school trip. For sure. When you're at school, you should be shown one of these. Yeah. It's part of a school yeah. trip. And then you, get, then you can chuck all those religious nonsense subjects out and say, right, today's angel tour. Which one should we go and see today? <laughs> that's my kind of school <laughs> they'd be queuing to get in that school wouldn't they they wouldn't be late <laughs> they'd be doing all the homework <laughs> everybody would be fascinated with the wonder of the world now many people wonder if the angels have good or bad intent that that's been asked in the question um, my beliefs are this another personification being applied again um, however, the question would be, can they be manipulated or affected? Example, CERN. I'm going to say this, so mm -hmm. over to you. Is that two questions, yeah? Or did you answer the second one? <laughs> uh, no, can they be manipulated or affected? Yes, yes they can. Yeah, yeah you could reprogram these to do literally anything you want. And they are being aren't like they? like the sun. You could reprogram the sun to go where you want it to go. Yeah. yeah. So yes, there could evil, be. Evil. If you know what you're doing with this technology and it's coding, then yes, it has. You could change the code easily to make them do other things that they weren't designed to do. Or, you know, I've thought of that before actually. Um, good. In fact, good job you mentioned that because this 24-hour sun thing in Antarctica. I'm remaking our season's video to include the 24-hour sun because I think there's something very fishy and suspicious going on now in Antarctica. Because previously, the globalists have tried to say there is a 24-hour Antarctic sun, but when you look at the footage, they actually fake the footage. And I thought yes. to myself, why would they fake it if it is capable of doing it? I can see it's capable of doing it. It's symmetrically correct for doing it. But why would they fake it? Now I'm thinking it didn't work. There's something wrong. And perhaps they fixed it because all of a sudden you've got a lot of famous people now wanting to go out to Antarctica this winter, winter 2024, December 2024. There's going to be a lot of famous people going to Antarctica to watch the 24-hour sun. Now, if it was doing it every year, why all of a sudden is it a big interest now? Very true. So they've done something, or fixed something, or reprogrammed something, it's telling me. Because when I'm looking, you know, the 24 hour sun in the north and south is June and December. Yes. And for 10 months of the year, it's just switched off going west to east at night. Returning, yeah. Yeah, so why don't you reroute it to give the north and south a few more months of sun a year? That could be done. Rather than have it switched off, you know, if there's no if there's no reason for it to be switched off other than just across to get east to west, then why not just send it north or south to give more daylight in those areas? That could be done. Should it be done is the question. 
So that I think is that, a question. Because I think this is what they're doing. I think they're starting to reroute the sun because now they're talking about knocking the ISS out of orbit in 2030. The ISS is the sun returning east, so how can they knock it out of orbit? <laughs> in other words, it's telling me they're going to they're going to try and reroute the sun, or it's part of the reset, and the sun's going to do something different. So people watch the sun carefully for the next six years because we need to know what it's doing. Especially it's part it's crossing at night. The ISS light crossing at night. If that changes, it means they've made a change, or the constructs doing something different. And we need to know what's going on, because it could be part of the reset. What countries would be best for that observation? Any? Um, any you know, the crossing east to west for 10 months of the year. If that changes or it stops doing that, then we have to ask, where's the sun gone now at night? Because it's not crossing yeah. going west to east anymore, so where is it? We need to know what's going on, people. What are they doing with it, is the question. Hijacking of the sun. There's, you know, you could put that over a country and leave it there for a year. That country would never exist again, would it? <laughs> it just fry. No, it would just be burnt to death. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, there's the worry people. This is the access these people have got, and that's what's worrying for me, and should be worrying for everyone, especially yeah, the, the military science world. and you know all their security and their generational minions. Um, you know, how can they? allow how can they be part of that that's that's you know that was another question sort of thing at the end i was going to ask you how could they be involved in such a thing against the creator i would well, say yeah, most I mean, well i would say most of the time the compartmentalization doesn't let them see that picture they're not seeing the big picture like like most people aren't they probably not don't comprehending and well, unless you realise, you know, hey, wait a minute, this this creates the sun. You, then you know what you're working on, don't you? But if they're only seeing bits and pieces and not much else, then they're, they're probably clueless on what they're working on. What would you say to them, if you know? What would you say to those minions, etc., and military people and whatnot? So, you I know, if say, they do question. Them. I would say you better take a look at our work and realize what can and cannot, well, what can be done with this technology and what they should not be doing with it because it can be reprogrammed. And you're playing with the creator's glory. If you've got kids, you should be worried because this is their future. Yes. They're playing with our kids' future, not just our kids, every living species' future. That's right. If they break this, who's going to fix it? Mm. Mm. Stop being so helpless, people, yeah. Got to take ownership mm. of it. It belongs to us all, and we we need to protect it from people like this. That's that's where we're at. That's the kind of understanding we need in this world. This is something special. You can't just go and do this, that, and the other without the permission of the people of the world, which is what the divide's all about. They divide them all, and you vote these idiots into power, and they've just took over it all. Yes. Claim to they represent it, but they hide it and give you cartoons on telly. They're despicable. I mean, you know... It's that's... the most evil thing I've ever came across. Oh, despicable. Absolutely. Every crime you can imagine has been committed, and crimes we don't even know exist yet. That's the bad side of it, people. You know, it's in the hands of the lunatics. The lunatics yeah. are running the asylum. They are indeed. So th I would say to them, the people out there, come and listen, watch our research, come and learn from us. You'll learn more about this world quicker than you will join in any Freemason secret society because they compartmentalise the same as everyone else. You're never going to get the full picture. This is too important. This is too important. You can't just hand wave this away. You can't just say, oh no, no, this is not going to happen on my watch. No way. No. 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 And I'll put, out, I'll put out as much as needed until the science world sits up and takes notice. Because I've got to show them this. They'll understand it quicker than most people. So I've got to show them what all this is relating to. So I've got to show the science world this and get them to understand it a bit and then they will realise how much danger we're in. Yeah, that tipping point again, yeah. Yeah, it's... 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to go that way anyway. The way that all these other agendas they've got, regardless of this and Flat Earth, and all these other agendas are going to push to a tipping point. But it's a tipping point that they want, whereas this, they don't want this. We need this. We need this out in the open for the world to learn and understand. You don't live on a spinning ball. You live on something of infinite scale. And we haven't even begun exploring it yet, have we? We're not allowed, no. <laughs> nope, we kept in. <laughs> we kept in, yeah. That's why it's all these that's why all these terrible agendas and systems exist to hide this and make sure you don't find anything out about it. Yeah, too busy. But it all leads to this. It all leads down to this. Oh, beautiful angels and just been ignored. Do you think they have the ability to communicate? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> you asked that question. I just remembered. Yeah, the you know, did the what was the question you asked? Do angels have the ability to communicate to humans or animal life? Um, I mean, I imagine we see the communication daily in things like local weather, but I think the question was sort of beyond that, if you know what I mean, like, you know, almost like a angelic biblical thing, you know. Like well, yeah, the... the interaction between the, them and us takes place in our blood and our DNA. So, yeah. so the biology will show you the interactions so yes they do they do interact that way as in developing growth and things like that mm -hmm. uh, is there other interactions I don't know um, it's a good question because there's their avenues that scientists need to go down and learn you know they, they still haven't figured out the human body yet they've been lied about the body you know, your heart's bit literally a halo, a part of the accelerator with a reverse flow. It's an Adam and Eve in one, your heart. And that's what's spiralling your blood around your veins. Our, our blood is something very special. It's got very special properties. Yes, there is very yeah, a secret in the blood. I'm convinced that... Well, we, it's, you we know, what, what, we, what we breathe in goes through into our bloodstream as well, doesn't it? You know, so the light entities that we're breathing in, the atoms we breathe in, it's given your body a charge into your blood. Electrical, electrical, charge. electrical charge is going on all the time. We, know, we are an electrical system. Yes. A biological electrical system. You know, we are an angelic being of the construct. A creation of the construct and its creator. Everything is, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. And it's amazing <laughs> when you look at all the, you know, there's not just life forms, there's a whole food source there to for them to eat, <laughs> to manage and yeah. live. Yeah. It's amazing. And people think this is a random ball flying through space. Are you serious? I know, it's quite an insult, isn't it? To, it's a serious insult, it is an insult to your intelligence, isn't it? The whole thing is. To the construct, it's, it and, is. And religion, religion is nothing but a blasphemy against the Creator when you realise what they've done with it. Absolutely. Absolutely, the inversions are yes. fierce. Yeah. yeah. They know what it is, that's why they run the world and hide it from you. They know exactly what it is and how it works. They just yes. don't want you to know. Greedy, greedy people. Goes be, that goes beyond greed, doesn't it? <laughs> goes way beyond yes, greed. Yes, it does. It's evil. It's it's weak. It's very weak it's, to, it's, to have to it's have. It's a very cruel, cruel thing to do to the human race and very, to the creator. It's an insult. Very. It is insulting. It is. And, you know, that's what we've got in our favour. We don't fear it. Truth doesn't fear investigation. We researchers investigate us and you'll come to the same conclusions. There's no other way around Truth it. You will, you will come to the same conclusions we have for the past eight years. This is a technological construct that's been hidden from us. Yeah. That's where we're at. And it's something far bigger and more special than we realise. And, you know, what, what's beyond yeah. our what's beyond our map? <laughs> what's, you know... <laughs> What's out there? We can, you know, we can only guess what's going on out there, but there's more of this, guarantee it. Why wouldn't there yeah. be? There has to be. 
If it's infinite, yeah. I mean, you know. You know, the, where's the creator? We get asked that question, why isn't, why isn't the creator stopping these people? Well, they're not really here to babysit us. And, we, you know, people do come in good and bad flavours. Usually there's a pretty good balance of good, but lately it's gone the other way, hasn't it? So we need some good back in the world. So all you people want to be heroes, now's your chance. Be a good person. Start, oh, well. start sharing this work and show people what's going on in this world. Get us some more inter- get, get us some interviews with the right people we can talk to about this. Yeah. Isn't it? We need to be talking to people at very high levels now. But people we can trust. Andrew Cross was an Englishman, born June the 17th, 1784. His was a wealthy family, and his family home was Fine Court, Broomfield, Somerset. Allegedly, Cross was a child prodigy, who had mastered ancient Greek by the age of eight. He attended Dr. Sayeth School in Bristol, where he became interested in the natural sciences, and the developing study of electricity. In fact, his father was a good friend of the scientists, Joseph Priestley and Benjamin Franklin. Andrew Cross continued his education at Bracenose College, Oxford, and following the death of his mother in 1805, he was left the family home, where he lived a reclusive life, studying mineralogy, chemistry and electricity. He became friendly with George Singer, who anthologised his book, Elements of Electricity and Electrochemistry, in 1814. According to contemporary accounts, the neighbours of Andrew Cross considered him more devil than man. He had constructed a massive array of copper wires and poles festooned around his property, which he had connected to his electrical room and there he experimented on the nature of electricity in the atmosphere. The local residents knew him as the Thunder and Lightning Man, or the Wizard of the Quantocks, local hills in Somerset. In 1814, when he was 30, he presented a lecture on his electrical experiments. There was a strong possibility that this was attended by the poet Shelley and his future wife Mary, And if this story is true, then Cross may have been the inspiration for her famous novel Frankenstein, written in 1816. It was some 21 years later, in 1837, that Andrew Cross undertook the experiments that were to make him rather infamous. He was fascinated by crystals and crystalline formations. In fact, in an early experiment, he had run an electrical current through a water flowing from a cavern filled with stalactites and stalagmites. He was overjoyed when crystals of calcium carbonate, from which stalactites and stalagmites are made, appeared on one of the electrodes. Until 1836, the English public had never heard of Andrew Cross. But by the end of 1837, he was being reviled from one end of England to the other. He was an atheist, a blasphemer, a reviler of our holy religion, a disturber of the peace of families, a modern Prometheus, a would-be Frankenstein, a man who had presumptuously attempted to rival the god that made him. But who was this dreadful person and just what had he done? Well, he was a simple, honest and God-fearing man, belonging to a class very common in the last century, but increasingly rare in this. In other words, he was a scientific amateur, having the time and money for prolonged experimental work, but gravely handicapped by a lack of scientific training and by an almost complete ignorance of the work of other men in the same field. His offence, which, incidentally, he had not committed, was of an unusual kind. He was accused of having attempted to create living creatures by an electrical process from dead matter. Indeed, it was further laid to his account that he had succeeded in doing so, 
that he had evolved in poisonous solutions fatal to all normal animal life, numbers of insects of the species Acarus, mites, which insects lived, moved and bred. Actually, he had done this, but he had not done it by design. And whether what he had done was in effect an artificial production of life remained and remains an open question which he did not attempt to answer. Here are his own words on the subject. As to the appearance of the acari and a long continued electrical action, I have never, in thought, word or deed, given anyone a right to suppose that I had considered them as a creation, or even as a formation from inorganic matter. To create is to form a something out of nothing, to annihilate is to reduce that something to a nothing. Both of these, of course, can only be the attributes of the Almighty. In fact, I assure you most sacredly that I have never dreamed of any theory sufficient to account for their appearance. I confess that I was not a little surprised, and am so still, and quite as much as I was when the first Akari made their appearance. Again, I have never claimed any merit as attaching to these experiments. It was a matter of chance. I was looking for silicus formations, and a car I appeared instead. In the year 1837, Cross was making certain experiments upon the artificial formation of crystals by means of weak and long-continued electric currents. The Akari first appeared in the course of an attempt to make crystals of silica, by allowing a suitable fluid medium to seep through a piece of porous stone, oxide of iron, from Vesuvius, kept electrified by means of a battery. The fluid used was a mixture of hydrochloric acid and a solution of silicate of potash. On the 14th day from the commencement of this experiment, I observed through a lens a few small whitish excrescences or nipples projecting from about the middle of the electrified stone. On the 18th day, these projections enlarged and struck out seven or eight filaments, each of them longer than the hemisphere on which they grew. On the 26th day, these appearances assumed the form of a perfect insect, standing erect on a few bristles which formed its tail. Until this period, I had no notion that these appearances were other than an incipient mineral formation. On the 28th day, these little creatures moved their legs. I must now say that I was not a little astonished. After a few days, they detached themselves from the stone and moved about at leisure. In the course of a few weeks, about a hundred of them made their appearance on the stone. I examined them with a microscope and observed that the smaller ones appeared to have only six legs, the larger ones eight. These insects are pronounced to be of the genus Acarus, but there appears to be a difference of opinion as to whether they are a known species. Some assert that they are not. I have never ventured an opinion on the cause of their birth, and for a very good reason, I was unable to form one. The simplest solution of the problem which occurred to me was that they arose from over deposited by insects floating in the atmosphere and hatched by electrical action. Still, I could not imagine that an ovum could shoot out filaments, or that these filaments could become bristles. And, moreover, I could not detect, on the closest examination, the remains of a shell. I next imagined, as others have done, that they might originate from the water, and, consequently, made a close examination of numbers of vessels filled with the same fluid. In none of these could I perceive a trace of an insect, nor could I see any in any other part of the room. In subsequent experiments, Cross discarded the porous electrified stone and for the most part produced the acari in glass cylinders filled with concentrated solutions of such substances as copper nitrate, copper sulphate and zinc sulphate. The acari generally made their appearance at the edge of the fluid surface, but he remarks, in some cases these insects appear two inches under the electrified fluid but after emerging from it, they were destroyed as if thrown back. In one case, the Akari appeared on the lower part of a small piece of quartz. 
immersed to the depth of two inches in fluoric acid holding silica in solution. A current of electricity was passed through this fluid for a 12 month or more, and at the end of some months three of these acari were visible on the piece of quartz, which was kept negatively electrified. I have closely examined the progress of these insects. Their first appearance consists in a very minute whitish hemisphere formed upon the surface of the electrified body, sometimes at the positive end and sometimes at the negative and occasionally between the two or in the middle of the electrified current and sometimes upon all. In a few days this speck enlarges and elongates vertically and shoots out filaments of a whitish waxy appearance and easily seen through a lens of very low power. Then commences the first appearance of animal life. If a fine point be made to approach these filaments, they immediately shrink up and collapse like zoophytes upon moss, but expand again some time after the removal of the point. Some days afterwards, these filaments become legs and bristles and a perfect acarus is the result, which finally detaches itself from its birthplace. And, if under a fluid, climbs up the electrified wire and escapes from the vessel. If one of them afterwards thrown into the fluid in which he was produced, he is immediately drowned. I have never before heard of acari having been produced under a fluid or of their overthrowing out filaments, nor have I ever observed any over previous to or during electrization, except that the speck which throws out filaments be an ovum. But when a number of these insects in a perfect state congregate, over are produced. The acari thus produced lived generally until after the first frost, which was invariably fatal to them. In a later experiment, Cross succeeded in producing an acarus in a closed and airtight glass retort filled with an electrified solution, one wire being led in through the wall of the retort and the other through a cup of mercury at its beak. The solution was a silicate one, prepared as for the first experiment and was put in hot. On connecting up the battery, an electric action commenced. Oxygen and hydrogen gases were liberated. The volume of atmospheric air was soon expelled. Every care had been taken to avoid atmospheric contact and admittance of extraneous matter, and the retort itself had previously been washed with hot alcohol. This apparatus was placed in a dark cellar. I discovered no sign of incipient animal formation until the 140th day, when I plainly distinguished one acarus actively crawling about within the bulb of the retort. I found that I had made a great error in this experiment, and I believe it was in consequence of this error that I not only lost sight of the single insect, but never saw any others in this apparatus. I had omitted to insert within the bulb of the retort a resting place for these acari. They are always destroyed if they fall back into the fluid from which they have emerged. It is strange that in a solution eminently caustic and under an atmosphere of oxyhydrogen gas, one single acarus should have made its appearance. Cross also succeeded in producing acari in an atmosphere strongly impregnated with chlorine. But while these assumed the form of perfect insects and remained undecomposed until after the apparatus was taken apart over two years later, they never moved or showed any signs of life. His experiments were repeated and extended by another enthusiastic amateur, Weeks of Sandwich, who took a number of precautions to ensure, as far as possible, that no animal life was present at the start of the experiments. For example, he baked his apparatus in an oven, used distilled water, filled his receivers, inverted over mercury troughs with manufactured oxygen instead of air, and superheated his silicate con solutions. After about a year and a half of electrification, acari invariably made their appearance. Control experiments made in exactly the same manner and with the same apparatus, but emitting the electrical current gave uniformly negative results. No acari appeared. He also made quantitative experiments and found that the number of acari electrically produced 
varied roughly with the percentage of carbon in his solutions. Weeks' experiments, although most intelligently conducted, seem to have attracted little attention. He communicated a summary of his results to the Electrical Society, but does not appear to have published a complete account of them. In view of the precautions he took, it is interesting to note that at the height of the cross for all, no less an authority than Michael Faraday stated in a paper read at the Royal Institute that similar appearances had presented themselves in the course of his own electrical experiments, but he was doubtful whether they should be regarded as a case of production or revivication. Andrew Cross understood he was walking on thin ice before the most respected scientists of his day. He was explaining an event that was completely foreign to their orthodox knowledge, and because of that he was inviting mockery, and the mockery came quickly. Charges of hoax and fraud overwhelmed him. He and his so-called insects were condemned openly as nothing more than a deception. As is often the case, time has obscured the precise procedure needed to perform this experiment successfully. Therefore, we may never know how and why these tiny creatures were created, or if they were ever created. However, could it have been conceivable that Cross, by chance, discovered the primordial soup that <laughs> evolutionists theorise was needed to create the world's first life form? Or is there another explanation? Even today, scientists cannot explain away the Akari that were perhaps created by Cross. And it is interesting that no scientist is even willing to reproduce the intriguing 19th century experiment. Andrew Cross died in the room in which he was born. He was 71. For many years he lived the life of a recluse, shut off from society, shunned by his neighbours. He died as he had lived, an honest man, who would make no concession of any kind to popular clamour, but sought truth wherever he might find it. Such men are the true salt of the earth.